Well, hello and welcome back to the VBPH Sermon Podcast. This is Pastor Adam with you, and so glad to have you along for this journey on Testimony Tuesday. And we're so glad to welcome you back, uh, every listener. And this is our first attempt at doing a live recording for our premium subscribers. And I can see we already have one listening in our audience. I don't know who you are, but uh, if you can somehow give us a shout out in the chat, then we'd be happy to give you a shout out. And um, we are uh, we are supporting world evangelism with everything that we do here uh, on the VBPH Sermon Podcast. All of your premium subscriptions are going to Thursday night world evangelism, and that's pretty awesome. And so on this Testimony Tuesday, we are very excited to welcome in a dear friend and minister of the gospel, somebody who actually was in my wedding way back when, and uh, his name is Paul Alvarez. Welcome to the podcast, sir. Hello. Thank you for having me. I, it's funny because <laughs> well, I was not the... thinking about you, and, and I was like, I bet you he's going to mention that I was in his wedding. You know, I'm always kind of thinking about you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's whether good. whether that's uh, feelings of rage, anger, uh, <laughs> forlorn, <laughs> somewhere in between. Oh, these words are too big for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's awesome to have you, and I thank you for joining us on short notice. We uh, were recording this live, and uh, for our premium subscribers, as I mentioned, and so we had we had a guest all lined up for that who uh, unfortunately had to reschedule. So here you are uh, on last minute notice. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah. So for those who don't know you, Mr. Alvarez, uh, why don't you give yourself a little five minute uh, or less introduction conference style and tell us where you're at and, uh, and what God has been doing recently. Oh gosh, I get five minutes, not three. I like this already. Uh, a little flexibility. <laughs> we are, um, I'm Paul Alvarez, my wife, Deanna. We have got three kids, my son, Levi Madison and Kinsley. And um, we are in Lima, Peru. We were launched 2020. We arrived January, 2021. And wow, I don't even know where to get started. Um, God is moving like crazy. Uh, I think most people would use the word revival and uh, we're right in the midst of God just doing a lot of really, really fantastic things. So I've, I've been pastoring for nine years, c coming up on 10 years, and uh, it's just been the most fruitful, the most exciting, the most successful times of my ministry. And all just within like the last six months, our church has been open for <clears throat> I guess seven months now and I guess I'll start from the beginning we opened up and immediately we had 25 people and I think that that was the smallest service we ever had and so I, I had a translator I had witnessed to him in a taxi spoke perfect English I spoke no Spanish when me and my family got here we spoke no Spanish and so you know anybody that spoke English I just attacked them with the gospel and um, so, you know, he, he just locked in right away. And so he, um, we were real nervous, weren't sure if, you know, he was going to help us translate. But I mean, the, the weekend before we opened our church, he's, he just started asking me, you know, should I wear a shirt and tie and, you know, things like that. So I was like, yeah, you know, he, he locked in and, and um, he's been very, very loyal and, and a great blessing to us. But we opened our church. We only had Sunday morning services because he, you know, he w was just a new convert. We didn't want to put a ton of pressure on him. And um, within just three weeks, we had people in the church that were like, hey, are we going to do more church? And so I told him, hey, you know, what, what do we want to do? And so he had approached me and said, hey, if they want to do it, then I'll, I'll be available. We started having Wednesdays within three weeks. We were doing like a Bible study. And then um, I guess, gosh, like after a month and a half maybe two months we had people that really wanted to get involved and i learned my lesson from my first church in houston that um you know you implement ministry standards right away and so i told them hey i'd love to have you help but you know this is what we do here and and they all just kind of looked at me cross-eyed like why would that be a problem 
And so <laughs> like right off the bat, I mean, we were only open for a month and a half, two months, like I said, but they had enough of a testimony. <laughs> so I was like, sure, you know, we'll get you involved. And so we had um, one family and a single guy all, all jump into ministry. And since then, um, we have just seen crazy, crazy growth visitors. I don't think that there's ever been a Sunday that we didn't have visitors. And it's extremely rare that we don't have visitors even on a Wednesday. We even get visitors during our song service practice. We've had three visitors during our song service practice come in and then end up in church. And um, <clears throat> one of them, a family, they're still in the church. And so it's like everything we do works. Everything, you know, we had kind of a good handful of women in the beginning. And I started praying, God, we need more men. And God just started bringing in more men. I said, we need more young people. God started bringing in young people. So uh, last Sunday, we had 56 people. Um, our Sunday evenings are normally in the 40s. Our Wednesdays are in the 40s. Uh, full, Like I said, full song service. Like We have this amazing drummer. He's like, like one of my best disciples. We have three what I would call disciples, a bunch of other men who are pretty faithful to things. Um, one of my disciples came to, he comes to prayer with me every morning. A couple of other guys will just kind of poke their head in, but I've got one guy that comes with me every morning. Got filled with the Holy Ghost during prayer. Um, got, like I could just sit here and tell you all kinds of cool stories. A lot of fun. I mean, we're just having a blast. And so that's amazing. God is moving like crazy. Yeah, we ran out of space. And so Praise I did, God. you know, one, one of those uh, called Pastor Campbell and he pulled the trigger really quick. He rolled the dice really like big time because we, we, I started praying, God, we need that second floor for the kids or that we're on the second. We needed the third floor. And I started praying, God, just do a miracle. There was a gym up there. And I'm telling you, it was like just this crazy miracle. All of a sudden, the gym left. <laughs> and I was like, what are the chances? Within weeks, like two weeks after starting to pray, the gym left. And I asked the, the landlord, is it available? He said, yeah. Talked to pastor. He said, do it. And so the next service, we or the, before the next service, we signed a lease. And I preached this sermon about tearing down walls. <laughs> I pulled out a hammer, started smashing the wall right in the middle of service. That was pretty fun. <laughs> and uh, and then within three that days, awesome. we pulled all the walls down and then opened up the third floor for the kids. And we have tons of space. And it was just perfect because, like I said, we had we had 56 and we just kind of fit in there. We got room. We could probably fit 80 people in there comfortably without with kids. And so... If we're able to get our children's ministry going pretty pretty well, we'll be able to fit probably a good hundred hundred people, probably eighty adults in there, and kids upstairs. And so, yeah, God is that is that a lot is of fun. Awesome, I'm man. having a blast so, right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so encouraging, man. Well, that that's yeah. great to hear, and it's even greater to hear with the knowledge that we're going to come join you in a couple of months. Oh my goodness, I'm I excited. Know. Oh my gosh. And the people, they already know you guys are coming. They're like, when I told them, cause you guys, so this is what's going to happen. You guys are going to come though. So that we're having the conference, the Peruvian conference, the very next week, you guys are coming for a week. And the very next week, Ed Tejero from Spring Lake is bringing, I think he's bringing 12 oh people. Oh my I think, goodness. <laughs> so, that's all, I don't know what to that do. Is Holy Ghost. Gonna be, yeah. I said, we're going to be tired, but you can tell everyone <laughs> in the church. I've already got one guy said, I'm going to take the week off. And so we're going to, we've got these, we're right next to a market. We're right next to a park. We don't have to go anywhere to outreach. We just go one block down the street and we can, uh, it's the park isn't quite open yet. Cause there's this whole amphitheater that they just built. It's like they, they, um, they just, God was putting all this together for us. And so we'll be able to do music. I'm hoping it'll be open. Imagine that. And uh, yeah, it, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be so. But uh, yeah, we can do music on the streets, wow. and I've got I've got all the equipment, so we're 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 gonna have a blast. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So I'm so excited. I yeah. think we have uh, I think we have ten people on our list. Uh, we're getting ready to buy oh. tickets here pretty quick. Oh yeah, and it, it's it, you're gonna have fun. This place is insane. It's a little crazy. So yeah, uh, we'll have to go through the guidelines of what to bring and what not to bring. So yeah. <laughs> Well, how That's exciting, man. I can't wait. I can't wait. And uh, I'm sure just by just by hearing what you've said so far, you've already encouraged a few people. So we appreciate that amazing report. Lima, Peru, man, is on fire. Is there is there any room Please. left for other churches in the city of Lima? Oh, my. 
oh my gosh, I am like totally pulling on everybody that I can. And, and I, I don't know, I, like I can't say it with any more confidence. This place is fertile and ready. Like I, I'm telling you, we can put so many churches in this city. I, you know, I don't know really about the other cities, but because I'm here, I know about Lima. There are yeah. so yeah. many areas we can put churches, and I'm I'm pulling on pastor a lot, and and just I'm really hoping that at least at our, our conference, we just watched the the El Paso conference, and I'm sitting there just, oh God, put another you know couple couples in here, and so I don't I don't know that anybody quite knows about Peru, but it's when you look at the city, the history, it's kind of like how in the world? I mean, honestly, South America I think as a whole is yeah. just untouched and i don't know i think there's a stick maybe a stigma you know when i say colombia what do you think and probably drugs and coffee you know yeah 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 Yeah. actually they do have very (laughs) stuff but um yeah man it this place we need a good 10 more so it'd be wonderful so. Well, hopefully somebody who hears this interview will be inspired. My, that, that is, that's really my dream from this podcast is that yeah. somebody would hear an interview like this and say, God inspired me to go. So, I promise that I promise that I promise <laughs> you will be. Well, yeah, this place is, is fruitful. It's fertile. It's ready. So, Amen. Amen. I can't wait, man. Can't wait to see what God is going to do in the next coming weeks and months and years to come. What a blessing. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. So we, uh, we've we got to hear the beginning of this story because, uh, you know, just, just by hearing what God has done in the last year doesn't tell the whole story. And so uh, for, for uh, I, I kind of feel, I kind of feel weird doing this because I know you pretty well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've got some history, but, yeah. uh, but a lot of people who don't, who don't know you well, um, I'd, I'd like for you to kind of share your background and, uh, how you grew up. Uh, I know pastor, for those who don't know, pastor Bob Alvarez is your dad. And so you got to, you got to see what pioneering and all that was like from an early age, but why don't you tell us what your family life was like growing up? Um, my family life was really, really good. Um, yeah, my, my dad's a pastor. And so he, he raised this real well. He was, uh, my dad's really hardworking and um, so we, we didn't grow up with very much money. You know, we were pioneering a lot. And so my dad always did construction. Um, but I think that kind of made our family really close. You know, but you know, we, we didn't eat in a lot of restaurants. We didn't have a lot of money to do extracurricular things. And so just as a family, we were always together and we were always following up on people, constantly having fellowships at the house. I mean, every night we had dinner at the table and had conversation. We all had this, the same seat that we sat in and, and we played board games. I mean, it just, my parents were very, very good parents. And um, my mom was a very, very good example of, of a submissive wife. My father was a good example of, of um, authority and headship. And, and so we, we traveled a lot. Um, I went to 14 different schools growing up. And, uh, wow. yeah, and didn't finish that high is... school. I was supposed to go to another one, <laughs> but, uh, that's a different story. Um, so I, I, kind of a lot of those things helped to form and shape, um, me mm-hmm. kind of in, in the character that I had, like, um, having to always being the new kid in school and moving around. And I didn't really have a lot of friends growing up just because, we were always pioneering somewhere, starting over. You know, the first question we asked when we would move somewhere new was, does the neighborhood have kids? And the answer most of the time was no. So uh, because of that, I I was sort of close to my dad. Uh, any yeah. moment that I could, you know, follow him around and tag along. So I was constantly tag along. And my dad uh, is very good at discipling men. And so I think he, he was always putting things in me and constantly, I loved it. I would, we would drive. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask which, uh, which cities do you think left, left the biggest impression on you as you were moving around the country? I don't know. I mean, I, they're all kind of the same. It, it's kind of a blur. Um, there, well, I had, 
there were things that sort of shaped me and my view of, of the ministry that I think there were just points in each church that, that um, kind of reference points that I can look back. I don't think that one necessarily was uh, bigger than the other, but there were just certain things that I kind of learned in each city and um, kind of an overall view of ministry and pioneering that, that I kind of... Do, do you some, remember going to Havelock? Good, <clears throat> I, so when we went to Havelock, I was two and a half. So I have some memories of it, but no, no, yeah. I, I just have memories of playing and things like that. So, but Colleen was amazing. You know, I was four or five coming up on six years old there and I have tons of memories of you know my my just the crazy uh, there was like revival happening and so that was a lot of fun to watch but obviously being that young I don't recall quite you know what was going on it just it was all amazing to watch all the events the all the converts all the fellowships and so but um, do, do you have any yeah. sense of uh of well, because because your dad was so instrumental in like the foundation of the Chandler Church and planting so many of these other churches around Jacksonville and Havelock and Colleen and several others. I'm sure we could mention. I mean, do you have any sense of connection to to see what you know what God has continued to do in those places? Not really. Um, like Colleen, I so Colleen was one that. Tons of the men, tons of the converts that were there when I was a little boy, they're still there. And so they remember me as being, you know, the little, little, uh, you know, rug rat running around the church. Um, and so when I pioneered in Houston, I was in and out of Colleen quite a bit. Every year we'd go to the, um, to the rally or the, the harvesters homecoming there. And so tons of the people, you know, they, they remember me and I remember them and we have fun stories and stuff like that. But um, yeah, that, that's probably the only one. Okay. Okay. Well, that's interesting to me. So, uh, so man, you, you got to see the, the highs and the lows and the hills and the valleys and the ups and the downs. Um, what it sounds like your family was pretty stable through all of that, but um, you know, what, what did that tell you? Is it, it, did you have a dream of like going into the ministry from early age? Uh, no. So it was kind of weird. Um, so I remember, uh, I, I mentioned this quite a bit when I preach. Um, but when I was probably about five or six, when I lived in Colleen, I, I, some people might think this was strange, but when I was young, I would go in the bathroom or, or sometimes just in my room or, but ma mainly like I'd, I'd be in the bathroom looking in the mirror and I would go in there and just kind of look at myself and wonder like, why did God make me? And I would ask myself, now imagine I'm like five, six years old. And I would just ask myself like, and I'd look in the mirror and kind of think like, who, who really is this guy? And what, what, why did God make me? Why did God give me my parents? And so and my parents always instilled a lot into me about just appreciating the fellowship, appreciating uh, being an American. You can see that I'm, I'm very patriotic okay. and, and yeah, and I, I, I love America. And um, I, I was just always grateful for those things. And I was grateful that I had good parents. And I always felt just a sense of responsibility that, that it's not fair that I was raised that way. It's not fair that I was American, could have been born anywhere. And so then I just sure. felt more of a responsibility. And then just as I would hear preaching, just the idea that it's like to those who are given much, much is required or to know to do good and not do it. It's a sin. And so I just almost and, and even to this day, I feel an obligation that that it was like I, I need to share this gospel. It's not fair that I was given so much. Actually, Pastor Greg just preached a masterpiece uh, Thursday night, last, last night at um, the El Paso conference. Everyone needs to go listen to that. It was a masterpiece, but it kind of describes what I'm talking about. He, he talks about the feeding of the 5,000 and just how there, you know, there's these back row people and he's like, and unfortunately all these front row people are getting fed over and over and over and over like in America, you know, it's, and so I've always felt bad, felt terrible. And so my I never felt God like 
touch me, didn't have a vision, didn't have a dream, didn't have some sort of like moment at an altar call. It was just since I was a little boy, I felt a responsibility that, that this is what I needed to do. And so that was developed, to be honest, watching my dad pioneer made me kind of not want to do it. And so as I as I became a teenager, you you know, between the age of 16 and 19, I, I wasn't living for God. And um, obviously you you were very instrumental in, in bringing me back into the church. But it was like I knew right away if I do this, if I if I get back in the church and really commit myself, it's not just, oh, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm just going to attend the church. Like I've got to I've got to go and pursue destiny. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, isn't that uh, maybe you would agree and tell me if you don't, but what I have seen from a lot of church kids and, you know, after having been in the teen ministry there in Chandler for a little while and watching a lot of those teenagers grow up, that, that's pretty common with a lot of them. And what that is, what, what I mean by that is those who uh, it, it's not that a lot of people are moderate in the middle. They're either all the way all in for Jesus or yeah. they're totally backslidden in the world. And especially those who grow up in our fellowship, it's like, you know, what's right, you know, what's true. And so if you're going to go in, you, you got to go in all the way. And otherwise, yeah. yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, you know how it is anyways, being, being on the fence, being indecisive, you, you know, it, it's going to be a hard to be a Christian, whether you're a church kid or not. And so, you know, either you're, you're all in sort of anyways. And so, and we, I think most church kids know, okay, if I, if I'm going to do this, I can't do it half hearted. And it, and it's kind of rare. That was the issue that I had when I was, you remember when I was, when I was 16 was when I started going through my, my little phase and, but I would always come back. And that's, I think, kind of why you and a couple of the other men were like always kind of trying to grab on me because you saw there's something, you know, because I'd come back and and mark my words. It was like I would do well for three months. It was always three months, but I wouldn't give up my friends. I would still kind of be tiptoeing. And what made me finally commit was um, actually specifically, I remember like it was yesterday. I walked into the foyer in Chandler and to the right is the sanctuary and to the left is the prayer room. And I remember I was there on time for prayer. You, you, you know, you were someone that was always pulling on me. I don't know if you remember this, but you used to wake me up when I first got saved. You'd wake me up and make me come to prayer in the morning at like five in the morning. It was like, I don't what even, I jerk. was like, oh my I, and I was like halfway <laughs> saved, you know, I wasn't even, I, you know, but I remember like it was yesterday, I walked in the foyer and I thought, am I going to take a right and go into the sanctuary and goof off like I used to? Or am I going to go to the left and go in the prayer room and begin to build a prayer life? And I made that choice. I walked in there and the feeling that I had when I walked in that prayer room, I, like I, it, you know, it almost gives me goosebumps thinking about it. It was like, I'm going to be a man of God. Like I'm, I'm not a kid anymore. I have to, I have to do this. And so, um, yeah, it was like it, somewhere, you know, I had to go all in and, and the rest is kind of history. So, yeah. So you mentioned that that, that happened while you were in Chandler. So there, there was a time that your family had, had uh, come off of the, the field and come back to Chandler for a time. Um, how, how old were you when that happened? Uh, 12, 12 or 13, yeah. close to 13, somewhere around there. Because I think I met you when I was around 13, I think. Um, yeah. You and you and Shen and my sister were like seventeen ish around there. So Yeah. Um Yeah. So your older sister and my wife were really good friends growing up for the for the audience who's trying to figure all of that connection out. So yeah. they had spent quite a bit of time together. So that means, you know, uh I, that means uh I was close enough to your family to have been drooled on by your dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we, we spent a lot of time together. You were like the big brother I never had, except that I had a big brother. <laughs> you do have a big brother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, well, talk, talk about the time that you, um, 
that you spent not doing right. And obviously we want to come back to how you did get right. But, you know, the reason we kind of go through these times of our lives is because there's, there's people who are going to hear this, um, that knowing that you're a pastor, that you're a missionary, that you're experiencing revival. And, but to realize that, you know, pastors are human beings too, and that it gives hope to people. But can you, can you uh, <coughs> talk about kind of what pulled you away from the will of God for that time? Um, I think like anything, there's a kind of a series of events, but maybe I can mention this was um, my, my parents, when I was maybe a close nine, close to nine years old, we had come back for redirection for a time uh, like 91 to 94 or so. And then they got launched again to Coolidge. Uh, Coolidge wasn't wasn't that they took over a small church. Not, not a lot happened. Then we went to Michigan, took over a church, and it there was things had kind of started moving. They were they were going well, but then Pastor asked them to pioneer in Jacksonville, Florida, and nothing happened. It was it was a pretty bad situation. We had basically one convert. I think we were there almost two years and we had like one lady and her two sons and she wasn't even real, real faithful. And so um, my parents ministerially, I guess, or just um, spiritually weren't, weren't real excited, you know, weren't real encouraged. It was kind of a, uh, just a real barren time. So we came back in, I think, 97 ish. And so I was 12, 13 years old. And my parents really disengaged. They were very discouraged because things didn't really go well for those few years on the on the field. And my dad, like he'll he'll preach about this kind of black hole period. He has a really good sermon about it. Um, and so just in regard to ministry, there was kind of this black hole experience. Well, that was a really crucial time in my life. I just turned 13, 14. I'm starting to go to junior high. I'm starting to go to high school. Like I had said, that sort of shaped my view on the ministry that I wasn't real interested. I didn't, you know, my dad was always trying for miracles. He was always, I wasn't seeing a lot of miracles. And so it was just kind of like, gosh, what am I, what am I believing in? I don't know what I believe in. I don't know if any of this is true. And um, well, my parents weren't doing real well spiritually. And so they sort of, let me have more freedom than I should have. And Mm. they themselves were just dealing with their own spirituality. And so um, I I guess I just wasn't being covered real well. And, or maybe just not a lot of attention was being, being placed on me. Now my parents were good parents. Like I said, we still had dinner at home. My dad spent time with me. We'd go to baseball games, things like that. But he wasn't necessarily speaking into my life spiritually or um, he even admits there was times where it's just like, we'd go to a Wednesday service. And, and if, you know, pastor Campbell wasn't there, it's like, ah, let's just go home. Well, I saw that, you know, I'm a 14 year old boy. And I thought, oh, okay, I guess church isn't important anymore. And so anyways, yeah, I got, I got real distracted. Um, Typical things that I think every young church kid wants. They see the, all their friends having fun. Um, you know, you're enticed even to smoke cigarettes, which is just dumb, even in the natural. Um, and so I, I had friends and I was kind of a funny class count kind of kid. And I had friends that sort of liked me a little bit. And so they'd pull on me and say, let's go to this party. And so I was pretty good for the most part because I was pretty innocent. and got my driver's license and it was all downhill from there. My parents gave me a curfew of one o'clock for a 16 year old boy. They would ask me where I was. And I was a very, very, very good liar. Very good liar. Cause I'm a church. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. And there were a lot of, I could tell you some good fun stories about my parents, you know, trying to catch me, but they caught me doing things they, that I shouldn't have. And, I got sort of some slaps on the wrist. Other times, you know, I got I got some good punishment, but I I just bided my time and, and waited until okay, the punishment will be over, and I'm going to go back out with my friends. And, and they just kind of kept letting me do it. And so next thing you know, 
I just, I want to smoke weed. I want to drink. I want to party. This is a lot of fun. And, and obviously sin for a season was. And so my parents would kick me out, which I'm very happy that they did. And I will argue forever that parents need to do that. Um, I'm going to say something as a testimony. All of the church kid friends of mine whose parents wouldn't kick them out aren't serving God today. And I am. Mm. And they made a stand and they said, if you're going to do that, you're not going to live with us. And they kicked me out of the house. And um, if you're going to do what I, exactly? I went, what was the stipulation? Smokes. If you're going to smoke weed, if you're not going to obey our rules, if you're not going to go to church, if you're going to, you know, anything, you're going to go to church with us. And um, yeah. And, and this was about the time that my parents started to do better. My dad had actually um, gotten back into ministry and they were very faithful. My dad was highly involved in ministry, my mom. And uh, this is just right before my dad actually was about to start um, evangelizing again. And so, um, yeah, they kicked me out and I suffered and I was like the prodigal son. I, I found myself eating slop, which I know my dad was praying. Oh, God, make Paul mm. eat slop. And I ate slop. And luckily, I remember all the preaching. And the thing about it, I, you know, I lived in such fear of dying in my sin. And and yet mm -hmm. there were times I did some pretty insane things and thought, oh, gosh, you God had so much mercy because he could have just said, nah, I'm done and squish me like a little. Right. Hand. And um, I remember specifically one time being in the backseat and I was drunk. And I put the middle lap belt on and then I reached over to the right side and I pulled that cross belt over. And then I went to the left side and pulled that cross. I'm wearing five seat belts or three, three seat belts, you know? And, <laughs> and I remember saying, God, please don't let me die. There's a guy driving who was <laughs> drunk and all of us were drunk. And why I didn't die is because God had people in Peru. He wanted to save. So, but um, yeah, God had a lot of mercy. So, yeah. But like I said, I would I would come in, I'd do well, you know, guys like you or uh, Junior Morales or some of the other guys, they'd pull me in, I'd do well, I wouldn't give up my friends, and I'd go back out into the world. And then finally, uh, autumn of 2004, you just really, really started pulling on me, like big time. And to be, I mean, I, I'm very grateful for it, but at the moment, it was just like, gosh, would you leave me alone? Like, And I loved you. You know, and I, I always liked you, but I just knew we were, I, I'm living this way, you're living that way, where I, I know that we're, our lifestyles aren't compatible, but you just kept pulling on me. And it was the Holy Ghost, man, because I, I just remember those times, like, um, you know, getting drunk and just sitting there crying and praying to God. And, and, and it's like the next day you'd reach out to me. And, and so and you pulled on me and pulled me back in the church and saved my soul. And I'm very, very grateful extremely grateful so well i didn't save anybody i just brought no, you to the one you, who could I know, uh, but it but wasn't just me yeah. I, there was there's prayers of your parents and pastors and other people all along the way i'm grateful for the the part that i played and i appreciate that but uh, you know looking back on it i don't think i was treating you any differently than, than i was treating <laughs> anybody else at the time you know what i mean like yeah, I don't yeah, I don't yeah. think of it like I, I didn't have this special mission mentality for Paul Alvarez. I was just like, yeah, you were one of the guys that I was that uh, of the 20 other the people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you were just it's, the one out of the, the crowd that actually responded. So, you know, I'm, I'm, as you're list. talking about <laughs> <laughs> as I, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking about people here in Virginia Beach that, you know, for the last five or 10 years that I've been consistently calling and praying for and believing God for. And like, you know, you never know when, when the time will come that, 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 you know, that that switch actually happens. So be yeah, encouraged. I mean, three Sometimes years. it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was three years, three years of just, I was a bad, bad convert, but yeah. <laughs> so, Talk about your salvation experience and how is it that you know your life was changed? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, like, um, it was, so my, my salvation kind of in the beginning was, yeah, it wasn't like I went to the altar and got up, um, 
you know, delivered from everything. I like it was very, very hard for me to quit smoking weed, stop drinking. I did still kind of go to a couple parties, believe it or not, there was one <coughs> one time I I I just wasn't really doing well because I, I was real faithful to go to church and things like that. But I don't remember. It was just a couple months in. Maybe it was a couple months in. And um, on a Friday night, I was supposed to be a Bible study, your Bible study. And I skipped. And I never told mm. you this. But I went to a friend's house and, and I smoked weed. And you were calling me. <laughs> and I remember looking at my phone like, oh. What am I doing? But it was like that for a few months. I I think I had I had prayed maybe in September of 2004, and then um, September, October, November were pretty rough. I had to go to jail for for three weeks because um I had had a warrant for a fight I was in, and um, so being saved, I was like, okay, I need to take care of this. So I went to jail, and then even even New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve of 2004. I went out to a bunch of parties. I didn't drink. I didn't do anything, but it was like, uh, I just wanted to be with my friends. And then it was like, just being a typical new convert, I was like, okay, New Year's Eve, um, New Year's, I'm going to start doing right. And 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 uh, surprisingly, I did actually. I, I went ahead and like, okay, I need to cut everybody off. But those first few months, it was like, I was coming to church. I was making really good choices, but then every once in a while, I'd kind of be where I shouldn't be. And, and it, that's probably what helped kind of the the light bulb to go off is like, you know what? I feel so much better when I'm with the guys at the church. My spirit feels clean. My my conscience feels clean. And I'd still go out and I wouldn't partake like it's, you know, I wouldn't be out there drinking and stuff. But it was like I'd be in the atmosphere and just be looking at everybody sober. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> Go to a party, you're drunk, you're high, everything seems great. But go when you're sober and you realize <laughs> these guys are all idiots. And you think, yeah. is this, this is how I used to act. And, you know, and you just see how fake everybody is and just the, the, re- the reality of sin. And so yeah. the first few months were a little bit rough. And then, um, yeah, I just said, you know what, I'm going to stick with the guys. And I remember, you know, a handful of the disciples who was like, you know what, I'm going to go out there and street preach. I remember... Again, like yesterday, the first time I street preached. And I think that I think there are those those steps of faith that you take that that help you to shed some things. And I think I went ahead and just jumped in and said, Okay, I'm gonna go street preach. And when you do that, there's something that happens in your spirit. And it's oh, yeah. like that just a boldness to overcome. I remember street preaching right there in front of the in and out on uh whatever the baseline and safely remember that was the spot for a time and uh yeah street preaching i didn't have a clue what i said and uh yeah and then so you know just step by step started making some choices yeah yeah you were well you were the one that was you you really cut you pushed it on me you're like here grab the mic i'm like i don't want that and you like it was a bullhorn you put it in my hand you're just like go I'm like, well, I'm not going to be a sissy. I guess I'll just start <laughs> yelling at these people. You're all going to hell. No, I don't. No, I don't. But um, I get, I, and then I don't remember. Were you the one that led Gorilla Team during that mm-hmm. time? It would have been 2005. Yeah. So, and I think I think you started pulling on me to go to Gorilla Team, and every Saturday I went on Gorilla Team, and I think that really Dude, those did were something some Holy too. Ghost times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And remember we had we had a good amount of churches over in California. We were constantly going to California and, and that was great for me. You know, it kept me out of trouble and and then yeah, just tons of fellowship. That was a time when we'd be up all night playing spades and doing all kinds of, you know, just crazy crazy Christian craziness. And it kept me out of it kept me out of trouble. And so but I mean, you know, I, I was a real work in progress, still am, but oh. it was, I had, a, I had a lot that needed to be worked on. And so I'm glad people were real gracious with me. And I, I probably about, was a difficult, go ahead. Uh, I'm curious, um, 
how, how it played out in your family because you know for your your parents to kick you out when you were living the sinful life um how was it uh, or describe what it took for you to make amends with family members well so because we're a real tight-knit family um my parents are maybe to a fault a little bit uh real forgiving and when it comes to family and so uh, my brother and older sister, nobody, none of us were living for God during that time that, you know, and my, my dad will preach it and has said it during that black hole experience. Uh, none of us were serving God. And so I was the first one that, that had gotten back into church and then Shannon. So at that time I was living with Shannon. Uh, my, that's my older sister. My older brother was backslidden and, uh, my younger sister was backslidden and, um, so I was living with my older sister and I started like going to prayer in the mornings and going on outreach. And you know, a lot of people have made this statement like, wow, what an amazing change God has done in your life. And, and he did. I mean, it, it was a night and day difference. I, I mean, I was one of those guys, I had no character at all. And, you know, now all of a sudden I'm, I'm doing what's right. I went and got a job. I'm being responsible and paying my tithe, things like that. And so my older sister saw a huge change. And she, I remember just, you know, we'd sit and have these talks, just the two of us in her living room. And, and she'd just tell me, she'd always call me Polly. And she'd say, Polly, I see just, I can see God moving it. And I want that. And, and, uh, and I remember she just, you know, again, like you guys and a few of the, the other people got her in church and she got saved. And then, um, my dad was evangelizing and doing really, really well. And then um, my younger sister got saved. And then they, so they got, <clears throat> they got launched, took over a church in Clarksville, Tennessee. I was only saved for about six months. Mm -hmm. And um, so I stayed, which, which was obvious, you know, the obvious choice. I stayed in Chandler. They went to Clarksville. And then not long later, my brother decided because he, he just didn't like Phoenix. He moved to Clarksville, Tennessee with them, with his family. It wasn't long after that they got saved. So then there was this time my parents were just seeing revival in Clarksville and yeah. they were seeing revival in their family. We all got saved. My brother was a song service leader, band leader. My Shannon was involved. She got married and her and her husband were Bible study leaders. And my little sister was there in Clarksville with my parents she was doing well. And so uh, there was definitely a connection. And, um, you know, over the course of time, we, we all are adults and have to make our own choices. And so um, my, my brother's not living for God now. My younger sister, she is, I, I guess, I'm not 100% not sure. She goes to another church somewhere, not in a fellowship. So my sister's still in the church, but uh, yeah. that was kind of the correlation. But my parents, right? So right Right when they saw that I was really serious about doing doing well, they said, if you want to move back in, you can. And um, and so I did. I moved in. And so for a few months, I was living there again and working a job, doing construction, uh, going to prayer super early in the morning. And so um, it was a huge blessing. It was a real good blessing. And then, like I said, they gave they got that midnight call and said, OK, you're a big boy. You're 19. You need to find a place to stay. And so I was like, you're right. Let me call Adam Dragoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so then we, I moved in we with had a house, for a couple months. And, we had a three-bedroom house that we didn't fit in because we that was before children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I stole one of your rooms and and your duck blanket. Sorry. Man. You know, I just, I hadn't thought about that duck blanket for about 10 years <laughs> until you just mentioned it right now. Oh, your leg is growing out. <laughs> well, no, what a blessing, man, to be able to to say that, you know, that I hosted the great and wonderful Paul Alvarez. Stop. <laughs> hey, do you remember this? Let me see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got the picture. That, so that, okay, so that was a really, really awesome time. So I think... That was one of the greatest oh. times of my salvation. Let me, let me describe that because there's going to be a lot of people who hear this instead of see it. Uh, I just showed Pastor Alvarez a picture of um, 
uh, him and I in the year 2005 in front of a firework exploding on the 4th of July in Chicago, Illinois. We had gone to a, a man, an impact team that changed all of us, didn't it? Oh my gosh. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, so people in the church told me that when I came back from that, there was something different. And, you know, I was already doing well spiritually, you know, and faithful and things like that. I, I don't think I was quite in ministry. I think I got a ministry just after that. But um, they were go they were going to have an impact team, and kind of last minute, I didn't think it was possible. Kind of last minute, um, they had really good. Bill Moore had had gotten us really good price on tickets, and so I told my parents, and I said, "Man, I would love to go." And my dad said, "If I pay for your ticket, would you get the time off and go?" And I said, "Absolutely." So they paid for my plane ticket. It was the first time I'd ever been on a plane. We flew there, wow. and it was the most amazing outreach. I mean, you remember, it was like just, you know, 100 miles an hour from early morning to late at night. And it was fun. We had, like, we had fun, which was, it was really good. But it was like we witnessed everything that moved. I remember going on the subway and I, I believe that we did a little bit of street preaching on the subway. Oh yeah. But it was like on we the L street train. preaching yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And it was like, oh gosh. I mean I it just did something to me. I remember street preaching and just witnessing to everything that moved and and um I believe that's where you taught me the way of the master before you know mm -hmm. anybody knew what the way of the master was. And I remember just kind of learning. I was like, man, I'm going to try. And everybody that I ran into, do you consider yourself a good person? And <laughs> yeah. And, and I, yeah, I check think, this one out. You remember this guy? Oh yeah. Where did his shirt sleeves go? <laughs> Dude, look at those biceps. <laughs> <laughs> man, I was, I was like, look at so, sideburns. Goodness. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So this guy who's sitting next to you, I just had Frankie Chi. Oh, for our podcast listeners, I just showed another picture from that outreach where you're sitting next to a guy on the floor. This was in Frankie Chi's church in Chicago. Mm -hmm. He was pioneering. And so I just had Frankie Chi here to preach revival for us <coughs> and last week. And I showed him that same picture. And he says, you know, that guy is still serving God today, and he still remembers that conversation that he had with you in that prayer meeting. Really? So how crazy is that? Yeah. I don't have a clue what we were talking about. <laughs> I can say. Well, yeah. apparently you made an impact. But uh, wow. yeah, cool. crazy crazy stuff, man. We'll but, find out. Uh, well, let's I, watch the rerun in heaven. Exactly, exactly. So, so you got to catch me up because after that time, that was 2005, uh, we got launched out, and we were out of there in December. And, um, you know, out of sight, out of mind, I, we didn't talk for a while or we didn't talk as often as we did before that. But what started happening in your life um, as you were starting that journey, like toward ministry? Uh, well, I, I got involved in ministry. I don't I don't quite remember what I got involved in right right away. Uh, and then September. So that was July. I don't remember when you guys had left, but um September on my wife's birthday, she was turning 17. Uh, her parents kind of introduced us and we sort of started talking a little bit. And then um, things got a little more um, intense in December when we went to the, um, the Christmas banquet. And then from there on out, it was like, okay, I'm going to marry this girl. And so did 18 months of dating or struggling you know, to try to marry her and her parents gave me a lot of hoops to jump through and, and I jumped through them and there were still more delays. And so um, there was kind of a time where I was involved in a lot of things and just doing my best, you know, working jobs, trying, I just want to get married and start, let's, let's get this ministry thing going. And um, so we're just highly, highly involved. I, I, I I remember I, after you left, I moved in with some of the uh, guys from the Hispanic ministry. That was 
kind of funny. And uh, we lived just just across the street from the church, just not far. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like being home very much. And so every night I would go to the church and find something to do. And so I decided to teach myself how to play the drums. And so don't tell anybody, but I knew how to break into the sanctuary. And so I would break (laughs) into the sanctuary. Um, Hopefully that's been resolved by now. (laughs) <laughs> well, the statute to the statute of limitations, I think, is over, so I can't <laughs> imagine getting rebuked for it. But yeah, I sat in front of the drum set and taught myself how to play the drums. When I was living with you, I had started learning how to play the guitar, and um, so I just practiced and practiced and practiced and outreached and outreached and outreached. And at that time, Chandler, we just had this like um, kennel of disciples that were just like locked and loaded. We were doing these all night prayer meetings and street preaching constantly together. And yeah, just, I mean, it was, it was a machine at that time. And so I was just involved in a ton of ministry. There was a long, long, long time that, that I didn't have any free nights. It it was every single night I was involved in something and then um, got married and in 2007, we got married and um, just a young, ambitious couple. My wife's a church kid. She's a pastor's kid. And so I think we, you know, more than likely pastor saw there was a lot of potential and started giving us um, kind of leadership or, or just letting us lead some things. And um, I had a lot of character flaws and pastor knew that he was working, working a lot of them out of me. But, you know, it just took time. And, um, but I was, I was just involved in a lot of things and kind of, yeah, I mean, what, what had happened sort of by, by accident was, um, a lot of the disciples had, um, we'll just say we, we found, we found ourselves in a place where in 2008, um, I wasn't married very long, just about a year and a half. But in 2008, there was basically only two of us Bible study leaders who were available to be the door director. And um, pastor just decided to choose us. Um, We were still kind of young. I don't, you know, it wasn't the most ideal situation. I I was very prideful and didn't have the best people skills. And um, I was very hardworking, very ambitious. you know, I, I had I had a heart to, to see people get saved and I really wanted to be used by God. But I just I didn't really quite understand what influence was. I, I didn't understand what it meant to, to follow up and love people. And and so, um, yeah, we did. You know, I just worked my butt off and the problem I, I neglected my marriage. I didn't have the best. I didn't have the best marriage. Again, I was at the church every single night just working my butt off. And here's my wife. We had a newborn son and she's just at home, you know, like, and literally I, you know, it was, it was just a lot of immaturity, but I'd be at the church till like midnight. There were times I was there organizing and, and <laughs> just doing stuff that really wasn't, wasn't that important and neglected my marriage. We had, we had a lot of issues. And um, so then finally I just, I, I was making mistakes and pastor wanting to salvage us, sat us down. Now, at that time, I'd been leading songs for a real long time and involved in other things. So he let me let me stay, you know, the song service leader and things like that. But he just said, I'm going to take the door director duties from me and give it to somebody else. It was really humbling. Very, very humbling. Mm. You know, in a big church like Chandler. I, I'm know, sure you handed it, handled it well, right? Actually, yes. Yeah, believe it or not. Um Tori Williams was a big part of that, but it, it was the single best thing that ever happened to me. And I told pastor that years down the road, it was the single best thing because it was extremely humbling and I needed that because I was very, very prideful. And so, um, I made a choice. What's the right thing to do? And pastor walked me through a lot of it. Tori Williams at the time, he was a door director the year before me, so I had already had a good relationship with him. Then he had become the assistant, so he walked me through a lot of it, and we had a ton of conversation, and he really, really helped me to to get things into line and to, to really, and so Pastor Campbell, really, he hammered me and hammered me and hammered me, and that's when I began to realize the importance and the value 
and just the preciousness of people. And, and I just started making up my mind that I was going to smile and do what I was supposed to do, go to outreach, go to prayer in the morning, humble myself. I never disengaged. I never, um, you know, threw a fit. It was, a, it was very embarrassing. And, and there were men, other disciples who said things to me that, and I just spit my tongue and it was really, really hard. But, um, yeah, it wasn't long after that actually that that the guy who had taken over after me had made a mistake and pastor considered making me the door director again and and wisely didn't (laughs) and um but we just stayed bible study leaders we stayed involved in a lot of things and i just started to realize the importance of people and like man you can't talk to people a certain way and like what does genuine influence mean and it was yeah it was my coming to jesus moment (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, but it changed my life and it was the single best thing that's ever happened to me getting sat down so so and then wow. yeah we just kept building influence kept serving stayed super super involved again we were just had a band and drama team and and we were involved in like christmas plays and just just kept shipping away and, and started working on our marriage and started taking my wife out on dates and buying her flowers and doing all the things a man should have been doing. And um, then we got launched in 2012. And 2012. So that, that's mm-hmm. a seven year uh, journey uh, of mm-hmm. discipleship. Um, mm-hmm. I'm curious if you have any highlights or lowlights of that time um, that you would be willing to share with our audience. Worst rebuke? Oh, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that there was necessarily a worse review because they were all, Pastor Campbell has preached a couple times about me and he's, you know, he doesn't use my name, but he says, you know, I, I had this disciple and, and, uh, yeah, he was just, um, and just describes me as, you know, the worst human on earth. And he's like, and so I just made up my mind. I'm going to beat this guy to death. And, you know, and if he even breathes wrong, if he even breathes wrong, I'm going to smack him. And, and he did. And I got blamed for a lot of stuff that wasn't my fault. And um, I got accused of a lot of things that just weren't true. And I just bit my tongue. There were literally sometimes I walked out of his office and I, and I wanted to cry. I was like, man, you know, I'm trying my best. I really am trying to change. And, um, it was just painful. You hurt my feelings a lot. Like it, it hurt. So those seven years there were, I pastor did not do much to, you know, he, he didn't really promote me. You know, it was like, I could have done something really, really well in outreach go, you know, I could have ran an outreach, 50 people get saved and he wouldn't mention it at all over the pulpit, but you know, so-and-so, you know, did something. Oh, he wore a tie. Oh gosh, what a wonderful man of God he is. And, you know, and so he purposely went out of his way to, to make my time really, really hard. And it was, it was seven years of like, I was prideful. So he never exalted me. It was just a lot of starved you of attention. Yeah. And it's what I needed. Pastor Campbell is the master discipler. He always knew when to rebuke me. He would rip me to shreds. But there were times, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not at all. There were times that I'd get called into the office. And before I would walk into the office, there were times I would think to myself, I cannot handle, if if he rebukes me, I'm not going to be able to handle this. And um, I would sit down and his spirit was like, oh, I want to help you. You What's going on? You've got great potential. And he'd encourage me. And it was like, how in the world did he know that as his prayer life, you know, he's, he's able to hear from God, but just a master. And then there were other times, man, he'd be in there just samurai in the up, you know, and hmm. like, wow. Okay. So, but my, my discipleship process was just, I was black and blue for seven years. So, but well, yeah. he must have done something right. So you got you got sent out in 2012, and you went to Houston, Texas, a place mm-hmm. that has been on the radar screen for a while now in the Chandler Church. They've been sending oh, people yes. like crazy over there. 
Man, we got like 12 churches or something like that over there right now out of Chandler yeah. or one of Chandler's baby churches. So, <clears throat> yeah, we went in 2012, so, saw nothing for 10 what months. What was that like? Opened a building. <laughs> Seeing nothing for, for 10 months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Humbly. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, actually, um, I'd mentioned kind of back when um, I was watching my parents, kind of going back to what I was talking about when uh, I mentioned my parents kind of going through that time between like um, 94 and 97, 98, something like that. They went to those different cities, didn't see a lot of fruit. So to be honest, I had this weird idea that I was going to go to Houston and fail and get brief, got, get brought back for redirection. It was a weird, weird mentality. It was like the devil was constantly putting that in my mind. And it just, I felt like it was inevitable. It was the weirdest thing. And I don't remember what happened where that broke, but just, I don't know, maybe some prayer and fasting or something like that, but somewhere it broke. And I thought maybe I heard a, a sermon or something like that. And I thought, no, no, God, God, God wants me to be fruitful. God wants to build a church. God loves these people and God wants them to get saved more than I do. It, it's not about my mm-hmm. ministry or having something to, to show as, as you know, something that I build. It's no, God wants these people to get saved and they're going to get saved. And, and I don't know when, but it just snapped. And I thought, why can't I have a revival? Why can't, why can't God use my life? And so, uh, yeah, we built kind of built, built a little church, nothing real crazy. Um, good disciples, good, good converts. We had a good, good little core of people, ministry standards and a uh, dumpy little building, but we painted it nice and, and had some revivals, um, got off of support real fast. Didn't have the most money, but we just, my, my wife ran the finances and she's very good with money. And, um, so we were able to, you know, get off support pretty you gotta, quick. And, you gotta have one. One out of the two, at least. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm not. Yeah, don't give me the checkbook. Don't. Don't ask me to balance <laughs> it. My wife is the one. So, but um, yeah, paid for all of our own revivals and and yeah, built built a little fellowship church and it's still there. And all those people that we had are still there. Didn't lose one. And uh, yeah, 2006. We we were there until 2016. We miss those guys. We we love those guys still. And. Yeah. yeah. Have you been back to preach since then? Just once. Yeah, I was invited back once. I, I preached two nights and uh, it was oh, a lot that's of awesome. fun. So. Oh, yeah. And in 2016, you had the missionary call. Man, where'd that come from? <clears throat> well, like I had said, just the way that I was raised, um, like I had said, I, I always felt I was the guy, you know, I, I get a, people give me a hard time. I'm not a sissy, man. I, I consider myself a tough guy, but go. I cannot watch world evangelism videos without, you know, the lights are off. <laughs> lights come back on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but you can't. Gosh, I don't I don't know how. I'll be honest. I, I don't know how everybody doesn't want to go overseas. I, I don't know how, but it's. I understand not everyone is called to that, but why why we don't have more people beating pastor's door down asking to go, I don't know. So growing up, being an American, I always thought it's not fair. It's like so not fair that I was born in America. And so I'm going to give that up. Just the whole missionary spirit I had my whole life and didn't realize it. Just the idea of like Jesus gave up heaven and came and and grinded it out here on earth. And so it's like if I live to be 80, what's four years of my life? And and it's been a little bit more than that now, but what's eight years of my life? What's 10 years of my life? Honestly, I, I should be willing to give the rest of my life overseas. And that's not even that's not even sufficient. What makes me think that I deserve or am entitled to be an American and live in such a wonderful country with the gospel on every corner? And so um ever since I was I felt, okay, I want to preach immediately. It was, I want to go overseas and I'd watch world evangelism videos and our world evangelism videos were that 
world evangelism videos where they encouraged people to go to want to go overseas. <laughs> and, uh, right. and I was always encouraged to go overseas. And I think that um, all the world evangelism videos need to be that to encourage people to want to evangelize the world. And so um, I was a lot of times just really drawn and I knew what was involved. I wasn't, you know, uh, under any delusion of what, what it was going to take. So right when I got sent out, I immediately was like, Pastor, I want to go overseas. Well, first when he said, uh, yeah, where do you want to go? And I said, uh, Japan. <laughs> uh, I was young. And uh, yeah, yeah, why don't you go uh, build a church first? And uh, then we'll see what happens. So I started building a church. And so year after year, I'd be there at conference. Every year we'd go to the January conference and we'd bug Pastor and, and just tell him. And so one year, uh, 2000. 15, we were in Chandler Conference, and I could not, I just couldn't shake it. It was like, I'm not going to be satisfied in life. I'm <clears throat> I'm miserable if I'm not overseas. And I had a very good job in, in Houston, and our church was doing well. We were, like, taking all the steps that we should be taking. And uh, had every reason to just stay there and keep building the church. And like I said, I had a good job. And um, so I went to him and he said, yeah, you know, just keep building your church. And he had been telling me that. And then finally, um, it was on a Thursday. I said, no, my wife just, I, it was like, I wanted, I wanted to scream. And I'm in the hotel room. And my wife said, just go to his house then. And if you know pastor, you can always just go to his house, give him a call. And so I called him and I said, and this was like afternoon, maybe four o'clock. And I said, Pastor, I have to come over. And he said, yeah, that's fine. And I came over and he said, what do you need? And I said, Pastor, I'm serious. I have to go overseas. And he's, and I think that did something. He was like, man, this guy's intense, you know? He's for and, real. Um, yeah. And I had already been bugging him for years and he knew. And so, and our church was off support. You know, we were sending impact teams to other churches. Like it, it was a good steady church. And so he said, okay. I can't do it this year. Let's do it next year. And so for a whole year, I knew I was going overseas already. And I said, really, really? And he said, 2016, we'll, we'll send you. And um, and so then we revisited at January conference. We were there and he just, then we started hashing out, where do you want to go? So all that time we were building our church, knowing we've got to get some things established so that when we leave, we don't lose any of these people. And God helped us and, and we didn't lose anyone. And so we went to China in 2016. Yeah. Well, you know, ironically, that's actually an, a very interesting point that you knew that you were leaving in a year. I, I never really considered that because a lot of the times when, when guys leave, it's kind of a, it's an all of a sudden decision. And then yeah. there's a lot of stuff that has to get done in two weeks, you know? Yeah. So that's really yeah. a, a gift that you gave to the church there. That's amazing to, to consider that. Yeah, we we just kind of really shored up some some things and kind of established just uh, spiritually different, different dynamics, whether it was like really just making sure that these guys were serving God because of God, not because of us. Right. Um, uh, just different dynamics with discipleship, but then also money. Like we, we, we saved up a lot of money. We kind of set it up to where it was like, we, our lease was going to end not long after the, the transition. And so we were like, let's save a bunch of money, get things ready. So when whoever takes over, they'll be the, we, we kind of wanted them to be the couple because we'd extended our lease. We knew we were leaving, but we extended it for another year. So we could have changed buildings, but we said, let's, wouldn't it be cool if we just extend it for a year and then the new guy can come in and take them to the next level, kind of gives him some dignity. Yeah. And so we extended the lease, started saving a bunch of money. And um, I don't know if it was a bunch. I actually don't really remember what it was at the time. It felt like a bunch, but um, <laughs> yeah. So the um, it was Billy kid, Richard kid yeah. came and took over the church and, and we were able to just go, here you go. The thing's kind of running. Just keep running. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was pretty cool. So They're still there, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah they're from, from what I understand, things are going real well. So Good. So China, man, Paul Alvarez went to China. Shanghai. Do I look like a deer in the headlights? 
<laughs> was it everything you thought it would be? Overseas uh, missionary work? No. <laughs> oh no. man. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, have, having some phone calls with you <laughs> during that time. Yeah, but it was <laughs> the hardest time of my entire life. The most rewarding and also the most dark. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it. It was, uh, it's weird. I could sit here for a while and talk about it. So I don't even know where to get started, but it shaped and like it shaped so much in me. Uh, yeah, there's a quiver in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, you you ran up against some big demons well and not just that but it was you know you read the kind of the jacob experiences the wilderness experiences almost to a day i mean i'm we were off by either two or three days 40 months go figure mm. 40 months. The time of trial and testing. The time of testing. It, it, was, it didn't dawn on me until I was back in Chandler during 2020. So we got brought back during COVID. And I went back and I, because it, it was just a time of testing. Um, we were, we saw a ton of visitors. We saw a ton of like noise, nickels, and numbers. I mean, I, I had all of the right announcement or uh, reports when I gave my reports I could say all of the things that people wanted to hear but I wasn't building a fellowship church and not, I guess it's not that I wasn't building it it's that that it just wasn't happening and I was outreaching and witnessing to the to the day that I left I was still witnessing the night before our flight I was still witnessing to people and just had a heart for China had a heart for the people. I, you know, when you, a lot of people think you go overseas, God overshadows you with grace and everything you touch works. No, it was so many ups and downs. I, there were just God, Pastor Campbell, I, I wrote it in my Bible. Pastor Campbell made a statement when I was a young disciple, God can't use a man greatly until he can hurt a man deeply. And God hurt me really bad during that time. Not in the bad, not in a bad way, but just in that that Jacob wrestling kind of thing. And he he forged some steel in my soul. He God did it. I mean, it was there were nights I was up so late, crying out to God, just wondering why aren't these people getting it? Why why am I not seeing the conversions? I could have easily built sort of a church that you know, and we had people. You know, we we had outreaches that had tons of visitors. We we had people doing things like getting saved and being baptized, but it just we just didn't build what should have been built, what I wanted to have been built. And it was just a grind and God God putting some things in me and and um just to make a long story short, we pressed through barrenness and just said it doesn't matter if it was basically like the jeremiah thing me and one of the other pastors because a lot of us we had a lot of the guys in chandler or in china we we would have these heart to hearts together there was a lot of us there and we would just wonder like gosh you know there's it's a billion people why 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 is this thing not breaking open and why mm. and just and i can go through all of what i think were the obstacles but at the end of the day it was like we would sit there and say, well, look at Jeremiah. And they would, you know, and you've heard it a million times, the comparison. Jonah had a terrible heart, preaches a, what, a, a seven or eight word sermon, nine word sermon. And the whole city gets saved. Jeremiah is this man of God called from his mother's womb. And it just doesn't see any results. And so I made up my mind. OK, I have a responsibility to preach the gospel and they have a responsibility to repent. And I can't change them. And I'm not. I, I some and there were some guys that were seeing a lot of results and <laughs> you know we'd all get together in fellowship and it was like yeah yeah they just share all their results and I'd sit there and 
I didn't bring one person to a conference. We had a rally in a conference there in China. I didn't bring one person ever. And actually one woman went to my wife one time and she said, oh, you know, how many people did you guys bring? And she said, you know, and they would ask and it hurt so bad. And we bowed our heads. She bowed her head and said, oh, you know, we didn't bring anybody. And she looked at her and she said, then why are you here? Why did you even come? You should have just stayed home. And, um, yeah, it hurt my wife's feelings really bad. And, uh, mm. you know, she came to me, you know, crying and it was like, gosh. And so for those 40 months, it was that it was, yeah, we were just kicking butt, man, doing, I mean, to operate there, you had to work so hard and we worked so hard. We worked so hard and didn't see the results. Oh, well, <laughs> oh, well, and, <laughs> it's fun. And, same seed, different soil. Exactly. And we dusted our feet off. So let me tell you a story. So this is, we knew we were going to have to come home. We, we, you know, just in the conversations we were having with pastor, things, things weren't going well. We knew we probably just didn't want someone to come and take over the church. We figured we'd either try and turn it over to a, a native or just combine it. And so this is before COVID. So, um, I go to a men's rally in Malaysia. Pastor went ahead and sent me to Malaysia to this men's rally. Pastor Richard Ruby was preaching. And I remember at the very last service at the altar call, after everything was done, he just makes this statement randomly. And he says, um, help me pray for Venezuela. And he said, my heart is for Venezuela. I really have a passion for Venezuela, but we can't get anybody in there. It's, we're Americans. And, and I remember standing there at the altar. Now, I've always had a heart for Asia. We were actually supposed to go to, well, I'll tell the rest of them in a second. But I remember sitting there and I said, man, like I can really feel Pastor Ruby's heart. And I'm not somebody that's ever, I'm not that guy that hears from God a whole lot. Um, you know, God spoke to me, this city. and this, I know some guys do, but not for me. It's just never, God never spoke to me, Houston. I never actually really specifically spoke China. It was just like, where are the people? How big is Houston? Okay. Mm -hmm. How big is China? Okay. And um, I sat there and quietly, just in my own spirit, I said, God, I'd go to Venezuela. And I just kind of like, not that every day I prayed about it, but I just sort of thought about it. God, you know, when I pray, like, oh, God, I pray for Venezuela. You know, Pastor Ruby has a heart for it. And nothing happened. There's no Holy Spirit, tingly, goosebump, nothing. I was just like, oh, I'd go there if it was ever open. I've never, ever, ever had any sort of a heart for any sort of Hispanic country. So I fast forward to 2022, COVID. Pastor Campbell says, listen, just come home. We'll combine your church. And and we had eight churches in, in Shanghai. They all combined into kind of one and a half, two churches. And um, I'll explain another time. Um, and so... We come back to Chandler, sort of tail between our legs a little bit, but not had confidence because I had a prayer life. We were living right. And so I had confidence. You know what, God? I'm just going to do do my best. I'm going to witness to everything that moves. Came back to Chandler and um, pastor said, see if you can evangelize until conference. So it wasn't that far along, called a whole bunch of guys and actually got a full schedule. And so I was like, hey, this is going to be great. I'll just evangelize. I said, I'll move in with my sister. No reason to get a house because conference was only going to be in a few months. And so, um, but I said, I still want to go back overseas. And pastor said, okay, let's, where do you want to go? And I said, India. And he said, okay, let's do it. So we wrote it down, India. And, um, and then COVID shut everything down. And so mm -hmm. then I wasn't able to do those, the, the evangelism. And so it was just like, well, I'm living with my sister. I had some money saved. I was doing kind of some odd job type things to make some money here and there. We didn't need much. Me and my wife shared this tiny little bedroom. My kids had a bunk bed in my sister's loft. It was tight. And we said, well, it's only going to be till August. And that got moved. Our conference got moved, COVID, blah, blah, blah. And so Pastor Campbell kept saying, listen, uh, I don't think India is going to open. And so then one, you know, we're just stressed now. Well, great. I'm living with my sister here. I don't have a mm, job. I'm yeah, not. Yeah. And so we said, what about Malaysia? And so we switched it. It was going to be Malaysia. 
And so wow. conference is conference is going to roll. It's uh, so pa- we moved it. Pa- was Pastor? I'm just curious. Was was Pastor into sending you to Malaysia? Oh, he was into it. Was he excited? And I, yeah, he was like, because I brought it to him. Because I, I never, when we went to China, uh, he said, "Where do you want to go?" And I, I said, "Oh, China." He goes, "Well, what do you think about India?" And I said, "We'd go to India. That'd be cool." And then he said, "What do you think about Malaysia?" We're like, "Oh, man, that'd be really cool," you know, because China, it, Malaysia is a mix of India and China. And so right. I'm like, man, best of both. Ways. But I mean, that was like a pipe dream to me. You know, it was almost too good. Like, I don't, I don't think I would suffer enough. <laughs> and so, and so, um, so he said, so he ended up paying for us to go visit India. And we were going to visit Malaysia and China. And then like last minute, he said, yeah, never mind. Don't go to Malaysia because, and come to find out they were going to launch another church there already that year. Oh. And so he said, yeah, I'll send you to India and China. You go check it out. You tell me what you like. And so then, um, yeah, so it, it just ended up being China. So anyways, let me rewind real quick. We got back from for COVID and Pastor Campbell asked, will you take over this church in Chicago? And we said, and I had already just recently, I'd made a statement to Pastor Campbell. Um, Namdo Shwetama had preached a powerful sermon in the Chinese conference about what about your pastor's heart? You know, you've got this heart for a city. You got to, what about your pastors? And so I got up, I, after that sermon, I went and I called pastor. I said, I'm going to make a statement. I'm not lying to you. I will go anywhere you say, except for Iran, but no, I'm just kidding. I said, I'll go anywhere. You, I said, I'll go anywhere you say. And so he, he liked that. And so when we had arrived, he said, will you take over this church in Chicago? And I just said, yes. And he, well, you know, go check it out first. And I said, um, pastor, we'll go. I, I want you to hear from God. I said, okay. So we went, didn't hear from God. And he said, okay, no problem. He said, did God tell you yes? No, I didn't hear anything. Okay, come back. And it ended up being God. So COVID, we know, don't have to rehash that. So the, the Friday before conference, we're supposed to go to Malaysia. And um, it's Pastor Mitchell's funeral. Pastor Campbell walks up to me and he says, yeah, um, I don't think Malaysia is going to work. They're, they're just closed, COVID, everything. Imagine this is days before I'm supposed to be announced in my heart. Mm. It, it, I mean, for those like six, eight months, I had already been just my wife. We're living so yeah. unstable. We're making so many sacrifices. And I'm just like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, what in the world am I supposed to do? A lot of people don't see this kind of stuff behind the scenes, but this is where the real price is being paid, the, the yeah. missionary price. It's yeah. in the, it, the, the we, figuring things out. Yeah, Everything that we owned, this was sad. When we came back from China, everything fit, everything, me, my family, and everything we owned fit in one of the 15 passenger vans. And I lived yeah. that way for a year. I mean, so much of our stuff was packed away. I mean... When we finally got here to Peru, we started unpacking stuff. I'm like, oh, I didn't know I had that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I forgot I owned things. And and so, um, yeah, I, I don't remember how many suitcases, but everything we fit in suitcases. So we're living that way. Then pastor tells me, oh, figure it out. You might need to go pioneer. And everything is like, are you kidding me? So I go. It's Pastor Mitchell's funeral. And there's a guy that was in Shanghai with us for about a year. and um, I hadn't seen him since, you know, COVID. And so I ran into him. I'm like, hey, you know, what's going on, man? And long story short, he said, where are you going? Isn't your conference next week? And I said, I don't know. I just found out. Ha, ha, ha. I don't have a place anymore. And so he said, yeah, why don't you go to Peru? And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I know it's in South America, but uh, call me ignorant. I couldn't point to it on a map. You know, I knew it wasn't Brazil. And so um, he said, they're opening next month. And I said, you're sure? And he said, yeah, they, they're going to open next month, November 8th. So what was his connection to it? He was going. And I don't know what made him. I, didn't make, I don't know what made him choose. Never really asked him. But he said, we're going because they're opening. And he's he's um, Mexican and Guatemalan, so he spoke Spanish, and so he's you know he's like I'm gonna go down there, and I was like, wow, that's a pretty drastic change. You were in China, now you're. And I didn't feel anything from God, I didn't feel anything. But they were open, 
And that was the only place I could find that was open. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to go overseas. I wanted to reach those poor people who didn't have what I had. And so uh, I sat down. It was, you know, Pastor Mitchell's funeral and just kind of leaned over and told my wife, what do you think? This is so weird because you think you do this at conference, but it's at Pastor Mitchell's funeral, which just goes to show (laughs) Pastor Mitchell so powerful that even in his funeral, people are making choices on where they're going to (laughs) go. Right. And I and I so I leaned over and just said, would you go to Peru with me? And like even her, she's just kind of like, uh, yeah, uh, what do we know about it? Nothing. <laughs> and so there was a young disciple that had ridden up with us. And so he was driving on the way back down the hill to Chandler. I pulled out my phone and started Googling, like, is what he said true? It is. OK, they're going to be open. And then I just started Wikipedia. And what's what's it like? OK, they speak Spanish, not Portuguese. When I can learn Spanish, I'll figure that out. And just kind of went down the line. And the truth is, it didn't matter. It could have said that it wasn't safe. It could have said that there was this problem or that problem. They were open. And so Mm. we kind of just talked it out like a husband and wife do. And just my wife is like the best wife ever. And just said, wherever you want to go, man. And she didn't call me man. She called me babe or something. (laughs) And, um, And I said, okay, I have no heart whatsoever i have no pulling on my heartstrings for a hispanic country uh i'm not interested in preaching with a translator again i'm gonna have to work my butt off and try to learn spanish and um and so tuesday conference in the morning pastor campbell comes to me or he pulls me in the office and i know what's going to happen and so he said well what did you figure out and he pulls open his bible with his notepad. And if anybody knows, if you want to know who's getting launched, go steal Pastor Campbell's Bible, flip it open, and he has it <laughs> written on a post-it. And uh, so he pulls it out with his pen and clicks his pen, like ready to write something down. And to me, that it, I'll never forget that. I Wow. That my pastor was just ready to write something down is just insane to me. And so as I was sitting in the chair, I said, Lima, Peru. And he said, okay. And he started writing it. And he didn't ask me anything at first. Yeah. Yeah. And so then I sat and he goes, okay. And then you could tell he probably thought to himself, well, maybe I should ask him a couple (laughs) questions. And, uh, (laughs) you know, are there any churches there? And I've done a little bit of research. I said, yeah, there's 11 or 12, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't Peter Mayor there? Yeah, I know Peter. Yeah. Okay. And so this is what's interesting was Every time we would talk about India and Malaysia, the report was always this negative report. Oh, this this is the problem. That's the problem. This is the problem. That's the problem. He calls Peter Mayor right there. And if if anybody knows anything about the Dutch Fellowship, they are the best. They are all the best. They are all the best. I'm. They are just awesome people. And so he pulls open the phone. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Pastor, it's probably like middle of the night over there. And he just whips out his phone, starts calling, puts it on speaker. And the spirit, I mean, you could feel the spirit coming through the phone. Peter Mayor's like, oh, praise God. We would love to have missionaries there. Oh, yes, we'll do anything he needs. You just tell me. I'll send. And then immediately like that, within minutes, he's sending me emails. He's wow. you know, like communicate whatever you need. And it was like, this is an open door and I'm going to go running through this thing a hundred miles an hour. So uh, January, we needed to get a few things going. So we got all of, all of our stuff going January, we arrive. So let me, let me, let me re- rewind January a little bit. 2021. Yes. Yeah. 2021. Yeah, okay. I land and it was, you know, how it is. You go overseas or you make a stand and all of a sudden there's all these these obstacles. And boy, there were some obstacles. In fact, the morning that we left, now, you know, if you we we always like to plan ahead. If you know, we go to the airport super early. So we didn't need to be to the airport until like three, four in the afternoon or something like that. We started at like six thirty. I said, I'm gonna be there so early because I had to move everything <laughs> into into the vans you know all of our luggage because we moved there with luggage we didn't get a container or anything and so 
I had to go get it and the the van wasn't starting. And I mm. I had already knew there was a problem. And so I've got this picture of one church van pulled up to the other. And for whatever reason, I couldn't get a hold of anybody. Um, uh, Pastor Mark Tozer had to bring the van and I plugged them in and, and jump started uh, to, to try to get it going. And I, gosh, now I don't really recall all that happened, but I had to end up moving everything into a different van. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, it was a headache. But yeah, we got here the first morning. We, we got here super early in the morning and we were real tired. So we, we laid down to try to sleep. We woke up to the plumbing exploding and flooding this Airbnb that we we're staying. I mean, it was just a mess. But so the first day we go outside and we're like, let's go check the place out. COVID lockdowns, all that. You know, we're still wearing two masks. You have to wear two masks outdoors. You'd be sitting under a tree all by yourself. You have to wear two masks. So we're walking around and there's all these restrictions and things like that. And all of a sudden, I start running into all these beggars and their accents very different. And I could tell right away, that's more of like a Dominican, Puerto Rican, Cuban type, real bouncy Spanish. And so then I started to kind of ask around and remember I had said about Pastor Ruby, the place is full of Venezuelans because they're all fleeing from Venezuela. And long story short, I realized there's, this place is just crawling with Venezuela, literally millions of them here. And um, so long story short, we opened our church and my church is actually about 80% Venezuelans. Wow. And they're just flooding the place. And that, you know, I, I can go on and on about the, the kind of the, the issues that they face and, and kind of some of the obstacles to living here. But here's this whole people group that are, discriminated against and not treated very well and just abandoned and God's heart for these people is just crazy because they're flooding our church. And obviously we have Peruvians too. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm, it's not like I go after Venezuelans or anything. They just all started flooding into my church. You know, I can't even to this day, my, my witness in Spanish is pretty poor. So when I evangelize most of the time, it's, I would like to invite you to my church and I just hand a flyer off to people. And so mm -hmm. they all just started flooding my church. And right now, so we're pretty popular in our neighborhood. And so you'll overhear from what I've, some of the people in our church have said is that um, you overhear people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you go to that church where all the Venezuelans are and they they have the gringo pastor. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, God has given us crazy revival with Venezuelans. And mark my words, I know I'm saying this. Uh, and it's being recorded and a lot of people are going to hear this and uh, I'm not one to just say anything crazy, but God willing, I'm going to do everything that I can to disciple these men and launch them back to their country. And we're going to put churches in Venezuela. Praise God. Let's do it, man. That's Holy Ghost. They need churches too. They need the gospel just like anybody else. And there's there's no way we're going to get in unless you yep. send them back. And I have, That's right. I've got two two Venezuelan disciples, and they said they'll go back. And I said we'll do everything we can to send you back. And you know, there's there's things that are involved in that. It's you know it's not you're not just gonna it's not just gonna happen. But we're, we're trying to build a church with vision, trying to build a church that, that you know, is focused on evangelism, discipleship and church planning. And that's what we're going to do. And I, in my mind, I think that's the only way we're getting into Venezuela for a while. And yeah. I just think it's so crazy. I was at this men's rally. Pastor Ruby said, I have this heart for, for Venezuela. I mean, in Malaysia, you know, there are a bunch of Chinese and Malaysian people and a couple missionaries. Why would he say that? And we kind of, you know, quote unquote, answer the call. And here we are. And I believe we're going to flood Venezuela with churches. So this is what I love about are. our fellowship. Oh, you yeah. Have a you have a Mexican guy preaching in Malaysia to a Chinese missionary who's going to end up in Peru. <laughs> and and try to launch and try to launch people to Venezuela. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, but, but this, I, is, we're, this is the kingdom of God. Yeah, 
The longer you serve God, the more you realize this is so unique, what we're involved in. I would not want to serve God anywhere else. And again, think about it. Number one, you're born and raised in America. You won the lottery. Number two, you were witnessed to by somebody or maybe raised in a, in, a, in a family that is Christian. You could have been born in America, but raised by a Muslim. You could have been born in America, but raised by some drunks or some, you know, or somebody just never witnessed to you, but you got witnessed right. to. And then not only were you witnessed to, but you were witnessed to in our fellowship. You've won the lottery three times. And then for, you know, and I, I understand in our fellowship, not every church has all the vision or, or the, the resources to launch anybody, but to have been discipled by Pastor Campbell. I won the lottery four times. That, that's so not fair. And, and for some of us in, our, in the fellowship, just to be exposed to some of the men of God that we're exposed to or to have the resources available to us to go and for us to not go is insane to me. It's yep. insane. And... Um, this is worth dying for. Live for something worth dying for. So many people live for things, you know, would you die for your job? Would you die for, for money? Would you die for your entertainment? I wouldn't die for any of that. I'd die for my country. I'd die for, well, I'd die for God. I'd die for my family. I'd die for country. Live for something worth dying for, you know, and golly, we're lucky. You, you, you know what uh what i've been considering the last few days is you know we're getting we're getting ready for this trip we're kind of gearing up coming our, to peru our minds in our to peru absolutely <laughs> and uh we're you know as we're gearing up and i'm like you know we have one of the advantages is some of the people that we have are spanish speaking and so that's like an mm. advantage man all, all of the, the rest of us are like struggling on duolingo to try to figure out a few words that we can say while we're there but man, what a blessing. Yeah. And, and then Pastor Frankie Chi was here and he preached and he, he mentioned in passing that he's going to go, I forget where he said he's going. To, oh, he's going up for Pastor Francisco in, um, in New Mexico, who's got a Spanish speaking church. And he says, yeah, I'm going to mm -hmm. go preach revival for, for them, a Spanish revival. And I'm like, man, how many native Spanish speakers do we have in our fellowship that could today get on an airplane and flood South America, and they'd be ahead of you because you're on the fly trying to learn Spanish. Uh, to have that advantage, man, what a what, talk! Talk to that person right now in the back of their mind. They're saying, um, "Yeah, I speak Spanish. Uh, what could they do for the kingdom?" I have to be very careful. <laughs> um, and I, I don't, you know, I. When I when I go back, so we'll we'll come back this year for our furlough, and and I'll have the opportunity to preach. I I've already got a few places that I'll be preaching when I'm there, and I have to be really careful because I do want to mention that I don't speak any Spanish, and um, I mean I do now. I I'm somewhat conversational. I'm I'm pretty much conversational, but. When it comes to doing things like witnessing and, and I'm still, you know, people will talk kind of fast and I, and I just get lost a lot of times. But in real simple things, I, I can get by pretty well, but I'm not preaching in it. And like I said, I can't quite witness in it. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm trying really hard. And actually, just recently, I've, I've been praying kind of like I'm overwhelmed a little bit because I'm trying my best. And I feel like. Not spiritually, but I, I, I feel like my hands are tied like Moses, where he says, well, God, I stutter. And to be honest, I'm very embarrassed to try to use my, I'm very insecure about trying to use my Spanish on the pulpit. And um, my translator actually just recently uh, started missing. And so I've, I've had to try to preach in Spanish and it's bad. And they're gracious to me. And, and you know, they, they are, but so I, I say all that to say this is there are a lot of people in America that can speak Spanish and South America is there's a lot. And here, and I'm not, I'm, I don't know how to say it, but I just without saying it here, you got some guy that 
can't speak it, but I'm just willing to go. And God has given us revival. I mean, like everything that we're doing is working. And again, it's not anything that I can do, or it's not that I prayed or fasted or did something special. Just, but I'm, like I'm looking at a map right now, and I just think about all these different countries. And to be honest, I think everyone's doing very, very well in South America. Like I, I know a couple of guys. I've met a few that are from Bolivia or Colombia, and it's like everybody's doing well. Why are we not? Why is this not mentioned more in conferences? Why? Why are the reports not being, I never heard anything about South America. In fact, our, I'm kind of the first sort of missionary to South America out of Chandler. We had sent one to um, uh, Guyana, Guyana, uh, which, you know, it's an English speaking is kind of different. They're, they're a little bit different. Um, I, More I admit. Island, island and, people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, just different. So like out of Chandler, we don't have a ton of churches and it, we, you know, I get here and I'm, talking to the guys in Bolivia and Colombia and Chile and Argentina. And you're like, this place is rich and just ready. A lot of Catholics, a lot of religion, but gosh, there's a, they have a respect for God and pastoring and you got to work some things out in them, but gosh, what, what place do you not have to work things out of them? Right. And, and um, for anybody who speaks Spanish, please, you have to consider. I had a guy when I was in China. Um, we we had a translator. Unfortunately, I had to use female translators a few times. And we had a really sweet girl. She was she got saved and she was dating a guy that was going to school in America, Chinese guy, and he spoke perfect English. And he was he felt called to preach. This Chinese guy he had gotten saved in in a church. And uh, long story short, I, I, she's like, you need to pull on him to come here so he can be your translator and you can train him and launch it. We want to be pastors. And here's our hometown. We'll go to our hometown. Like she's into it. So I called them and kind of long story short, the guy would not, he's, he, he's living an American dream. He's going to a university mm -hmm. there. I don't remember what his, he, he was in, like, he, he got a degree in education or something like that. And so he said, well, um, there are Chinese people here that need to hear the gospel. And I told him, I remember telling him, listen, we have churches on every corner in my country. Let, let some Americans do that. Let somebody else. And he's like, well, no, there's, there's, and I thought, dude, there's a, there's a little handful of Chinese people there. Why would you not come back to your country? Your people, you speak the language. Hmm. You can help. And I and I'm over here struggling in China, giving my life. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm the American. I should be over there. You should be here. But but this guy not willing to go because he's living a comfort. Let's just be honest. He's living this very comfortable lifestyle. And yep. so I don't want to say it this in a mean or any like any sort of bad way. But it's like, gosh, here I am. I'm a I really am a gringo. Uh, I'm just this white guy that doesn't speak, uh, you know, I'm half Hispanic, but I don't speak any Spanish. There are so many people that can come here and right now speak Spanish, start evangelizing and reap this crazy harvest. I wonder how many things, how many people are following through my, my fingertips. Cause I just, I'm not connecting. I'm, I'm not able to, and I, my hands, I'm so my hands are so tight in so many different ways. I'm so overwhelmed and, and just trying to disciple, trying to, I can't read people well. I, you know, there's so many things that I'm, I'm just behind the eight ball on. And there are so many people in America that could come. And <sighs> America's nice. America's, America's nice. pretty nice. And um, yeah, well, in some ways, uh, it's vapid and empty in many other ways, but mm -hmm. um, what my prayer has been for every bilingual ministry in our churches across the fellowship. We we need God to really move on our on our Spanish speaking church members because uh, yeah, my, my heart is is there too, man. And you know, I, I would love to see I would love to see people 
j- jump on the mission field and immediately be able to be effective. Because I know so how much I, I struggled right. trying to learn the language. You know what I mean? Well, and uh, I, I mean, think think about it like this: You're imagine you've got some guy in your church being discipled, and he speaks fluent uh, French. Yeah, you know, and there there's these countries in Africa that speak French. And then he says, Pastor, I feel called. Oh, praise God. Where do you want to go? Japan. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. You speak French. Why, why would you go to Japan? And it, I mean, just think about it on paper. That doesn't make sense. Why God mm-hmm. gave God's giving you this. Why are you? And so, yeah. Oh, please, Amen. Hispanic people, come help us. <laughs> yes. Well, Praise God, man. I think we made we we made the point. <laughs> <laughs> In other news. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> need a, let's segue out of this one. <laughs> well, uh, I have to say that I'm really appreciative for you and your family. Uh, I, I appreciate your dad and his friendship over the years has been priceless to me, has come to preach in our church a few times. And uh, I'm really grateful that uh, that God has you exactly where he has you. It's cool. <laughs> and it's really, <laughs> it's really funny, too, just to think, I mean, two years ago, yeah, you're going to be in Peru. <laughs> Where's yeah. that? You know, like, yeah, <laughs> I'd have never thought I'd have never thought it was going to be cool either. If you would have, oh, you're going to be in Peru. To be honest, five years ago, if you said you're going to be in Peru, I'd have thought, oh, rough dude i don't want to go there (laughs) so but maybe god knew that i wouldn't want to go there and so he made it all happen the way he did so which is usually the case in the will of god right not what we expected there was a big whale with my name on it called (laughs) covid19 it's it threw me up in peru (laughs) yeah Right where you needed to be. Well, Mr. Alvarez, I've already taken too much of your time. I appreciate so much this amazing testimony and journey of your life so far. And I can't wait to see what happens next. I wonder uh, if you would uh, take the opportunity and pray for those who have listened to this and uh, pray that God would help them speak to them. Oh, man, you're putting me on the spot. Okay. Uh, God, we thank you for your grace. We're so grateful for what you did on the cross for us. And we don't take that lightly. And I'm asking God that just as Jesus was a missionary and willing to give up heaven, I pray, God, that you'd call people to be willing to give up the comforts of life. And I pray that you would make people feel uncomfortable in their lifestyle. I pray that you would cause people to miss sleep and be miserable unless they answer the call to finding the will of God for their life. I pray that you would draw people to South America people who are willing to come and preach the gospel. I just ask God that you would bring a conviction to our hearts about living lifestyles that that hinder us from doing your will. I pray, God, that you would encourage people by this testimony, encourage people uh, by these reports of what you're doing in this nation. And I pray that you would draw people to this city or to Peru in general or to South America. God, I just ask that you would move in the supernatural, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And uh, would you mind sharing with our audience two or three things that we can pray for you about? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I need translators. I need three translators. Three. Uh, the reason why is because the one translator I have is a great guy, and he's just a newborn Christian. And he, he took a really good job, and I'm I'm praying and fasting that, the, that he'll, but it's just sort of taken him out of church a little bit, and it's it's left us really in need. But you'll notice when he preaches a lot of, or when when I preach and he translates, he pauses a lot, and people kind of look like, are you struggling to come up with the words? And it's not that he's struggling to come up with the words; his English is perfect. It's that he's sitting there thinking about what I'm saying, and the problem is. All these six, seven months he's been in church, he hasn't had much of a chance to just sit there and hear preaching himself. And he gets my sermon, he gets to read it, and, you know, and I'm sure God is is gracious in that in that that way. But it'd be great if 
I had three guys and each one could preach yeah. one service or translate one service and the other two sit down and listen to a couple sermons a week. And then we're, we're starting men's discipleships this Sunday. And if you could pray that, that these things, cause you'll never, you'll never build a church without disciples. And that's the key right now is I've got, you know, 50 plus people coming to church and I need more columns. If we're going to build another level, I, I need more columns. And right now I've got three guys and even in that, like, I really need them to develop. But again, I, I haven't been able to because my the language barrier. And so if I had some translators that could just man, be, be lockstep with me, help me out in these men's discipleships, I want to do I want to do a lot of things. I want to have a new conference class at my house. I don't have a translator. I want to do this. I want to do that. Don't have a translator. So um, pray, please, if, if you'd pray and maybe fast for 10 days or something like that for me, that'd be great. Good Translators and discipleship classes. Hallelujah! Yeah, the call, the the cry of every missionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, In foreign land. Praise yeah. God, man. Well, I'm, I'm going to let you get back to your life. Amen. Have a great okay. weekend. We're praying for you. Uh, I I'll, I'll just maybe we'll uh, when we put this podcast out, I'll share some of the photos that you had sent to me from our last week that that you had sent to me. Okay. Uh, very encouraging to see what God is doing there. And uh, man, just a few weeks away, we'll be there. I know. I'm counting the days. I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you uh, to all of you listeners who made it this far. What a great time. We appreciate all of your support and for being a part of this podcast. Share it with somebody if you were inspired. And uh, we hope that uh, that you're getting something good out of it. I know I am. So um, until we meet again on Testimony Tuesday, this is Pastor Adam from the Virginia Beach Potter's House Sermon Podcast. Thanks for listening.